Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew again, and in this video we're going to be talking about Mendelian genetics. And we're actually going to start and take a step back before we get into Mendelian genetics, and we're going to actually talk about how organisms are linked by lines of descent from common ancestry. And so we're going to talk about the common origin idea, and then we're going to get into Mendelian genetics, and specifically how hereditary information is passed from one generation to the next. We call that the continuity of life. So let's get to it. So first off, it's important to remember that shared, conserved, fundamental processes that are shared amongst all organisms are evidence of common ancestry. So, uh, you know, we know that there's a variety of different types of cells, um, but we also know that all cells have ribosomes. We have know that all cells have cell membrane. We know all cells have DNA. And so we're going to look at these highly conserved structures and then also some highly conserved processes like some metabolic pathways that are found in large groups of organisms. And then by comparing those, that actually gives us some evidence of the common ancestry of a group of organisms. So looking at conserved components and conserved processes is going to be a key component of connecting living things. So, for example, we know that DNA and RNA are carriers of genetic information. And so the fact that DNA has the ability to get copied, it has an enzyme called DNA polymerase, we can compare DNA polymerases in any living things and see that is actually evidence for co uh, continuity of life. And then we also know that RNA polymerase converts the DNA into a messenger RNA. This process right here, while it's going to look different in a prokaryotic cell versus a eukaryotic cell, the conserved process of the production of mRNA, the use of ribosomes to then translate, these conserved structures and these conserved processes are going to be key uh, unifiers of the fact that all living things tie back to a last universal common ancestor. Now, we brought up this in our cell structures or our cell subunits unit, but the idea is that ribosomes are found in all living cells. And so by comparing uh, the structures of ribosomes, we're able to build a giant cladogram and see how different types of organisms are related. Those ribosomes have two subunits, and all those ribosomes are composed of a combination of ribosomal RNA and some proteins. And so we are able to look at the sequences of those ribosomal RNA subunits. We can also look at the proteins and we can look at the DNA that codes for those nucleotide sequences. And any one of those will allow us to have some evidence to look at um, how things have descended and modified over time as organisms evolved independently. So major features of the genetic code are shared by all modern living systems. And these things will include certain metabolic pathways that we will find, and we'll talk about those in just a minute. But we also know that there are certain struggles that all living things have to deal with. So one of those could be DNA damage. And so regardless of the type of organism that you're dealing with, whether you're dealing with a bacteria or a plant or a human um, or an archaea, all living things have to deal with breakage of DNA and how if the DNA of a cell breaks, how that's really a major problem. And so what we have found is that because of the universal struggle that all living things have to deal with that, that there are some common proteins that are found that are associated with repairing DNA damage that are found in a wide variety of cells. So these are specifically RecA and RAD51. And if you find the proteins and look at those sequences, what you'll end up finding is that there are actually remarkably highly conserved structures that are found in all different types of living things. And they're going to be a little bit different, but these proteins have a lot of commonality and they deal with the same problem of DNA damage. And so when you find a struggle that all living things have to come up against, and that that was probably a key thing for those early cells to survive, it's going to be conserved throughout time. And so when we see conserved sequences of code, that's again, evidence of modern living things descended from a common ancestor. Now, other core metabolic pathways are conserved across their already currently recognized domains. And so what we will look at is we can look at things like the process of glycolysis. Glycolysis is turning glucose into pyruvate, again, found in bacterial cells, found in 
all eukaryotes, all these cells have some process of breaking glucose down, or nearly all cells have this. It's a very highly conserved process found throughout the domains. Similarly, we will find structures like ATP synthase. ATP synthase is the enzyme that is found inside the inner membrane of a mitochondria, also inside chloroplasts. We also find them inside gram-negative bacteria. We also find them in photosynthetic bacteria. And in all of these instances, this is a structure that allows hydrogen to diffuse across a membrane and then is used to power the formation of ATP. And the fact that these ATP synthases are so universally found and the electron transport chains or other proton pumps are also universally found uh, along membranes in various types of living things, these are all going to provide evidence for the conserved pathway. And we could then look at the sequences for those ATP synthases and determine how long these have been evolving independently. But the commonality of these recognizes that these domains all will lean back to an originally conserved common ancestor. So now this actually brings us to our Mendel's laws. And so when we talk about Mendel's laws, we're going to explain how inheritance of genes and traits is described by Mendel's laws. We generally talk about Mendel's laws fitting into three categories. One of those is the idea of the law of dominance. And that's the idea that when there are two alleles, some of those alleles are going to be expressed as long as they are present, and we refer to those as dominant, and others are expressed only when the non-dominant is present. So for example, in our first over here, we see that we have these two red flowers. They are what we see as heterozygous, meaning the parents have one copy of the red allele and one copy of the white allele. And then when they pass those on, if both parents contribute a red allele, the big A, we get a red flower. If either of them pass on the dominant red allele and the other passes on the white allele, we're going to still see a red flower. But if both of them pass on the little a white allele, no dominant allele is present and the flower will result in being white. The second law that we often talk about is the law of segregation. And that again ties to our red and white flowers. And the idea of segregation is that as an individual has a big A and a little a, it will sometimes pass on a big A and sometimes will pass on a little a. And the formation of those gametes is going to be the segregation of the big A from the little a so that only half of the genetic information is passed on to the next generation. We can also see this over here where we tie it to meiosis. And what you can see in this example where it's got the big R, little r, big Y, little y, it's showing you that the big R and the little r and the big Y and little y are going to segregate from one another when they are going to be passed on so that each one of the gametes either gets a big R or a little r and that the two R forms segregate from one another as they pass on. The same thing is true of the Ys. All of the cells will either get a big Y or a little y. Those cells segregate through the process of meiosis and the formation of those gametes. The third law we often talk about with Mendel's law is the idea of independent assortment. And an independent assortment, what we see is that we have an initial parent that is big R, little r, big Y, little y. And in independent assortment, that's our two word law. When we talk about two genes, the passing on of the R allele does not influence the passing on of the Y allele. And that what that means is that we can pass on any combination of R's and Y's that are found in this original parent cell. And because we have four different alleles, we have two R alleles, a big R and a little R, and two Y alleles, we actually have four possible combinations. You can pass on big R, big Y. You can pass on big R, little y, you can pass on little r, big y, or you can pass on little r, little y. Any one of those four combinations is going to be passed on, and that will lead to enormous diversity in the possible gametes that can be passed on to the next generation. We will also note that the laws, as we've just discussed, are really true for when we have uh, alleles on separate chromosomes, particularly when we talk about independent assortment. If we were to put the big R and the big Y on the same chromosome and put them close together, we may not see that same process of independent assortment taking place. If those big R and big Y were on the same chromosome, then what we would see is a lack of independent assortment and we would see gene linkage. And we can talk about gene linkage later, but that's an exception to Mendel's law. 
And so we're not going to worry about that. Just like if we were to see chromosomes not separate appropriately during meiosis and we had some sort of failure to have them segregate that led to a form of trisomy, that would be an exception of Mendel's laws and not a demonstration of Mendel's laws. One of the big things to talk about is that fertilization involves the fusion of two haploid gametes, restoring the diploid number of chromosomes and increasing genetic variation in the population by creating two new combinations of the zygote. And so it's important to know that while we have these two parents down here that are big B and little b, they're able to produce offspring that have genotypes quite different from themselves. So for example, they can produce ones that look like themselves like big B or little b, but they also produce a big B, big B, or they could produce a little b, little b. The little b, little b is not only a different genetic makeup compared to those parents, it's also going to physically look different. And so you can produce new combinations of genes. And we're just looking at one copy in this particular case. Uh, the other thing to note is that the rules of probability can be applied to the analysis of the passage of single gene traits from parent to offspring. If you were to have some sort of strange exception or something doesn't follow the normal rules, that's where we would start to look at the processes and say, did something go wrong with segregation? Or did something go wrong with the idea of independent assortment? Or maybe are there some other exceptions to Mendel's laws, which we will talk about in a separate video, things like processes of sex-linked traits or things that are incompletely dominant, or maybe more than two alleles associated with a trait that may be at play. And so by knowing the general probabilities, it could tell us whether or not something falls outside of the mathematical likelihood that something would happen. Now, it's important to know that the role of probability in segregation of alleles and fertilization in a genetic cross, the probability of dominant trait being expressed in, is dependent upon its frequency. So in this case, both parents possess the dominant and the recess of genes for the trait of the flower color, and so that the dominant trait is expressed three quarters of the offspring, and the recessive is one quarter. And so when we see this, we can see that the probability of each of them uh, taking place is really sort of the, the crucial mathematics that we see in the law of probability here relevant to the equation. Again, my exceptions to this. So fertilization involves that fusion of the two haploid gametes, restoring the diploid number. But if the pattern of inheritance, monohybrid, dihybrid, sex-linked, genetically linked genes, often can be predicted from the data, including a pedigree that the given parent genotypes and phenotypes and the offspring genotypes and phenotypes. So what we can see is that when we look at patterns, we can look at family trees or pedigrees here, or we could end up from the results of a cross determine that, oh wait, when we made a cross between two individuals, we didn't get true independent assortment. Therefore, we must see some sort of exception to the law of independent assortment. And that might mean that the genes are linked, which means that they are physically close together on the chromosome. And in fact, we can mathematically determine how close two genes are based off of how much they violate the law of independent assortment. And then we can map, physically map, where the different genes are based off of how far they go from our expectations of a dihybrid cross following independent assortment. So we can use those patterns as a key to figuring out if things violate the laws. All right, well, that was a pretty quick summary of how we have the continuity of evolution over time and how genes are passed from one generation to the next from the one generation passing on all the way back to where we had our last universal common ancestor. We also hit upon some of the key Mendel's laws. And then we also talked about how we can use data to evaluate whether Mendel's laws are being supported, refuted, whether or not there's some other pattern involved aside from simple probability that we'd expect in a simple dominant recessive cross. All right. I hope that was helpful and I'll talk to everybody soon.